This tutorial begins our discussion of how plane waves propagate in uniaxial birefringent crystals. Now when we talk about a uniaxial crystal, you'll remember that we define something called an optic axis. And normal to that would be slices of a crystal and oscillations within that slice of the crystal experience one refractive index and electric field oscillations along the optic axis experience a different refractive index. So we can now pose a particular question. Let's suppose we have a plane wave whose electric field points off in some direction. I'm going to draw an arbitrary direction here. And the electric field oscillations at here and everywhere else in this region of the birefringent crystal oscillate like this. So there's the electric field maximum vector, and I'm going to call that vector E0. I'll put a little slash through the O there because we're also going to define something called EO. So this is E0, what we've called E0 throughout the semester. And we'll ask the question, given that E0 is in this plane defined by the optic axis, OA, I'll write that as a vector. So there's a plane defined by the optic axis and by the K vector of this plane wave. And we're going to say that K also lies in the plane of the page here. And I will draw, draw it at some arbitrary angle like that. And so I'm going to call that K. And for later usage, I'm going to break that into a magnitude wave number k and a direction which I'm going to call s hat and that's so that I don't have to write lots of k hats and k's and get you confused about when about all these different k's so the direction of the k vector is s hat and its magnitude is k and I'm going to define an angle from the optic axis to the k vector and call that angle gamma so given that I've got an uh, a plane defined by two vectors, the optic axis and the k-vector, and I've got an electric field also in that plane. The question is, what is the direction and magnitude of the k-vector? So we will have solved this problem if we can figure out what k, the magnitude of the k-vector is, and what direction s is, which is equivalent to finding out the angle gamma. The electric field in a birefringent case can be broken up into two components, a component along the optic axis and a component perpendicular to the optic axis. So let's do that. I'll draw some vectors here to represent that. So the component along the optic axis, we're going to call that E extraordinary. And that's because that electric field oscillating in that direction feels chi extraordinary. That's the definition of the optic axis. And then there's going to be a component of the electric field, and that is the component perpendicular to the optic axis, and we're going to call that E ordinary. Again, I've written a little O with no slash through it to make sure you know that's an O and that's a zero. And oscillations of electric field in this direction are what we call within slice, and so they experience susceptibility chi O. Mathematically, the assertion there is that the polarization P divided by epsilon naught now has a component caused by the extraordinary component electric field and a component caused by the ordinary component electric field. It's going to be equal to the sum of the two polarizations, one from the ordinary part of the electric field and one from the extraordinary part. So that's going to be some vector that in general does not point in the direction of the total electric field. So the polarization is not in general going to point in this direction. I can emphasize that to you by grouping terms as follows. I can write this as chi ordinary times EO plus EE. 
And since I actually have chi e of e e, and I've written here chi o times e e, I have to add the difference of the two susceptibilities to get the expression up above. So here I've just trivially rewritten this expression in terms of this grouping, and it just emphasizes that this is the direction of the net electric field. EE plus EO is the electric field. And so this would be a vector pointing in the direction of the electric field. And then as long as chi E and chi O are different, which is what defines birefringence, I will have an extra component in the direction of EE, either positive or negative, And that makes the polarization vector not be parallel to the electric field. I will indicate that here, notionally, this could be some possible direction for the polarization vector. So the electric field is applied in a certain direction, and the atoms polarize, the electron clouds polarize, not quite in a parallel oscillation. We'll see videos and things that animate that. That's not the job of this mathematical tutorial. But that's the physical thing that's interesting about birefringence, is how the shaking of electron clouds is not in the direction of the applied field. But let's figure out what this means for our mathematics. We are going back to the master E equation. And let's remember what that looks like. So there's the master E equation that we've seen before. And we are going to assert that this is still going to be solved by a plane wave. We've already sort of tacitly assumed that by writing a k vector. Let me just explicitly say here that we're going to assume a plane wave solution, as we have all throughout the semester solved this with various types of plane waves in vacuum and then in glasses. So the plane wave solution will have the following form. We'll, f we'll say that the electric field is a function of position and time will be that E naught vector and then E to the I and I could just write K dot R here but I'm going to explicitly emphasize that it's the refractive index felt by this beam, which we will call n. And then I'll write k naught. That would be the k vector for this frequency of oscillation in vacuum. And s hat. All I've done here is rewrite the k vector, k s hat. k is equal to n k naught something we've done a couple other times this semester. So that's dot r vector minus omega t as always. So we presume that the solution will look like this. And we're highlighting n because n is, unlike in the past where that's been a constant of the problem, this is going to end up being direction dependent. Depending what direction this plane wave travels in the birefringent material, the value of n is going to change. The speed of the wave depends upon what way it's going. That's the special property of a birefringent material. Well, the fact that we have plane wave solutions is nice because we still have the way that del squared and second derivatives of time and del operators operate on plane waves. All that stuff is retained from earlier in the course. So del squared of E, that's going to become del squared brings two factors of ik down. So two factors of ik gives me minus k squared times e. The two time derivatives of both e and p, they both depend on time, like e to the minus i omega t. So two time derivatives brings down two factors of minus i omega. And that, along with that minus sign, allows me to write the time derivative terms as plus omega over c naught quantity squared e plus p over epsilon naught. And then the
del operator, each time you see a del, you would write i times the k vector. So that's two factors of i gives me a minus sign. The two factors of k gives me the wave number squared. And then the, the direction uh, of this resulting gradient is s hat. And the del dot e becomes what's left over is s hat dot e. Again, s hat is the direction of the k vector. Now I l relate n to k. The relationship is as it is always, that the wave number squared for a plane wave is by definition the refractive index squared times omega over c naught squared. So once we've got this expression, we can insert it in where we see k squareds. That will give me omega over c naught squareds in every term here, and I can cancel that out. I'll also flip the overall minus sign. And before I move on, a quick pause to correct something. I'm going to emphasize in the vector diagram here, this is, this is the full electric field E oscillating like this. And EE and EO are not constants either. They are oscillating in time as well. So there's an implied time dependence, var time variation, not only when you write an E in this problem like here, but there's also a time varying component in EE and EO that are written here. And they oscillate all together so that as the, B the red E oscillates like that, these two blue vectors are also growing in scale as in a balanced way. Okay, let's move to the next line of this. We flip the minus sign to a positive sign. We've canceled out the omega over c naught squared in every term, so all that's left here is a plus n squared, and then times the electric field. We flipped the sign, so this becomes minus. The omega c over c naught squared is gone, and I'm left with e plus p over epsilon naught. And let me now start to write out that as four terms, because e, remember, is a sum of the extraordinary and ordinary fields. So let me write this as E ordinary. And I'm going to put the extraordinary over here for reasons you'll see in a second. And then I've got P over epsilon naught. Well, P over epsilon naught is this weighted sum of E ordinary and E extraordinary. So let me group those terms that I put the chi O E O here. And the chi e, e, e here. And then on the right hand side, this term, I flip the sign, so I get a plus. The k squared, again, only the n squared survives after I cancel out the omega over c naught squareds. And I will retain the remaining terms. Now, notice how much E ordinary field do I have? I have an amount 1 plus chi ordinary of it. And 1 plus chi ordinary, we're going to define that as we always have all semester. When you have 1 plus chi, that gives you a refractive index. Well, 1 plus chi ordinary is just a number. Chi ordinary is a constant. And so we're going to define a constant, and I'm going to circle this to emphasize that it is a constant. And we're going to define that constant to be named n ordinary squared. Similarly, how much E extraordinary do I have? The amount I have of that is 1 plus chi E. And that we are going to allow to define another constant of this material. And of course, we're going to call that an extraordinary squared. So these two things are constants. I want to keep emphasizing that. N is direction dependent. So it's not always the same to, for all plane waves traveling in birefringent materials. But NO and NE are simply constants of the material. They're just like talking about chi O and chi E. They're just different functions of those primitive variables. One other thing that we will do is we'll split this E, write it as a sum of E ordinary plus E extraordinary. Now, Everything on the left-hand side is in terms of E ordinary and E extraordinary. I have N squared times E ordinary, 
and I have NO squared times E ordinary. Grouping those terms together, I get N squared minus NO squared E ordinary. I have an exactly parallel expression. I have N squared times E extraordinary, and I have N E squared times E extraordinary. and I still have that same expression on the right-hand side. So now we've got a final expression, and again it's a function of just two unknowns. There's n, which is related to what the magnitude of the wave vector is, and there's s hat, which is related to what the direction of the wave vector is.